Hello everyone. As I mentioned, my name is Matthew Weldon Showman. I am partner and director here at Jonathan Ferrara Gallery. Welcome to my office. I realize that many of you have probably not met me, let alone been to the gallery itself. And so I'm really excited to take this opportunity for you to get to know myself as well as Amanda and Jonathan in future takeovers better and just get a behind the scenes look at what we do here at Jonathan Ferrara Gallery and who we are. So a little bit about my background. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I matriculated to university studying pre-medicine. I joined a contemporary visual culture group in which I had to take an elective art history course. And I'd always had an interest in art before university, but really diving into deeper study of it, I found myself really taken by that very quickly changed my major, super fun conversation with my parents, and ended up going to Europe for a few years to study in Paris, Nantes in France as well, and London, and came back to the United States just ready to de dig deeper into museum and gallery culture. So much of my work experience is actually in museums. I worked at the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh for four years during my time in university, as well as in Europe at the Centre Pompidou in Paris and Delitzsch Picture Gallery in London, which is actually the oldest art gallery museum in uh, Great Britain. Once I had finished university, come back to the States, I decided I wanted to see a different aspect of the art world. And I really already knew that I wanted to be in New Orleans. My grandmother grew up in New Orleans, and so I had this sort of kind of hereditary tie to this locale. And so I just up and moved. I had written a few galleries, had a little bit of a promising sort of uh, prospect of working at a few of them. I very quickly interviewed and have been now with Jonathan Ferrara Gallery for nine years this month. So since 2011, I've worn many hats here at the gallery. I began as a part-time gallery assistant in 2011. In 2012, I got really excited about some curatorial projects and took on more of that type of role full-time here at the gallery. And then in 2013, the director actually left and Jonathan felt confident that at 24 years old, I was ready to direct the gallery. And we've been having a great time ever since. I actually am in the process of partnering with Jonathan in the gallery and there's more to come from that. So that's a little bit about me personally. I'm excited tomorrow to go deeper into my exact roles, my curatorial projects that I've worked on throughout my time at the gallery, as well as big acquisitions that I've helped to close with museum and public art collections. I'm also super excited to address all of your questions on Saturday, so please, throughout the time of this takeover, leave your questions down below. Saturday is going to be devoted to talking with artists, uh, potential collectors, whatever questions you have, throw them out. Come on in. Oh, hello. This is our reception desk where on a normal day you would find Amanda or I to greet you when you enter the gallery. However, during the pandemic, we have chosen to work in our back gallery and always with masks on, so you wouldn't normally see our faces. Nonetheless, I'd like to share with you the exhibition which I curated just two days before the pandemic. It opened and it will remain on view through August 15th. Come take a look. So this is my most recent curatorial project at the gallery. The exhibition is titled Art and Doom and is comprised of five international artists of all different types of medium. The exhibition idea really came from the National Museum uh, event entitled Art and Bloom and how the focus on art is shifted away from the artworks themselves and rather floral arrangements that are meant to respond to artworks. So partially I was looking to look specifically at art in this exhibition but also to kind of turn the idea of springtime, 
birth, rejuvenation, sort of this kind of laissez-faire attitude at that time of year, and continue talking about really important subjects, which you'll see in many of these works. Um, it's really sort of all over. I touch on religious pathology, gender inequality, uh, death and destruction. So beyond the conceptual underpinnings of this exhibition, I've also been asked to chat just a little bit about the process of realizing an exhibition from the very first moment that the idea of it exists. It's really kind of two-part. I either have an idea for an exhibition and then begin sourcing artists for the show to that speak to or somehow meet the criterion for the concept, and that kind of is also two part. It pulls from either artists that I've seen already and sort of cataloged in my own brain as well as my computer from art fairs and, you know, internet searches, looking through Instagram, all different ways I come across artists, especially our noted artist exhibition. Whether an artist is juried in or not, I often do save some applications from that to consider for other opportunities. The other part is I might then go looking for artists that sort of fill a particular void in my exhibition. So in this case, for this show, I already had a couple artists that I was really interested in showing, particularly William Woodward and his Seven Deadly Sins series, and Tiffany Calvert's Vanitas Still Lives, but I didn't have somebody really talking about anything very political, and that is where Nora C. comes in behind us. And her criticism of anti-abortion legislation. The other way an exhibition materializes for me is through the identification of some sort of theme or common practice or even just a similar subject matter in work that is emerging in the art scene. Again, be it at an art fair or through my own personal research. What's really fun about type of exhibition is that it's the artists themselves that are really determining the way that the show is going to create a conversation and connect together. I am not necessarily such a curatorial voice as much as I am sort of the maiden and the identifier of this commonality amongst the artists, but the artists are really the Unfortunately, I don't have enough time today to go into the particulars and specifics of the five different artists and their various artworks that are in this exhibition, because Amanda has me limited to a minute per post. However, please do visit our YouTube channel or the Art and Doom exhibition page on the JonathanFerrarGallery.com website, and you can watch an interview with myself, as well as the artists themselves, talking about the show in much greater detail. We're live. Hey, y'all. Um, <laughs> Welcome to the last day of the takeover. We will just wait a few minutes while everybody logs on, but just to give you an idea of what I'm working on right now, I am making preparations for a month-long event in lieu of our usual white linen night, which is the first Saturday of August that welcomes usually up to 50,000 people to the Arts District. We are planning this contingency event all August long, focusing on the first sat or the, every Saturday in the month rather. Um, White Linen Light is the title, and we are going to host two two week auctions throughout that time. The galleries will be open, as well as all of our Arts District friend businesses throughout the neighborhood. So come, shop, eat, and consume some art while you're here. And Amanda will be our narrator today, so she will be letting me know all of the questions that you've asked throughout my takeover, as well as checking in on your comments that you're leaving as we go. So just because this is a game of 21 questions, don't hesitate to leave some comments as we go along. So Matthew, are you ready for 21 questions? Is that the first question? <laughs> um, actually, technically, the first question comes from at D Zepetto. Hey, Diana. They say, hi, Matthew, great series. I would be really interested in hearing about a project, either curatorial or otherwise, that you're extremely proud of from your time at JFG. 
a partnership, a discovery, a project that you really believed in and that moved you? Um, well, I did speak about Art and Doom yesterday, and I think my most recent project is always the one which I'm most proud of because it's sort of that cathartic moment of I finished my research, the show's installed, and here it is. However, I am super proud of my group exhibition from a few years ago, Art Hysterical, which was really fun to create because as an art historian, I got to look at artworks that had specifically uh, either appropriated or were very derivative of art, famous works in art history. And so that was a fun show because it brought in a diverse group of people who maybe uh, didn't normally consume contemporary art, but were excited by the recognition factor of seeing a piece like Girl with Pearl Earring or, you know, Washington Crossing the Delaware, and we'll post some pictures of those later, but that show was super fun, and the two pieces that I just referenced are works by E2 Kleinveld and Julian, who from that exhibition went on to actually be represented at the gallery. We did solo projects with them at an art fair in New York, as well as we've taken them to Basel, Miami. So that show just, you know, was this group show of artists that we didn't work with that became a hopefully career long uh, representation of this art photographic duo based in Amsterdam, I might add. Before I give you the second question, I'm just going to let you know that everyone out here is, seems to be loving your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so at Jill Arwin Art has asked a couple questions, so I'm going to get into three of her questions now. She starts off by asking, why did you decide to become a gallery owner and director? It wasn't really a decision. Um, I touched on this the first day a little bit. So I'd always worked in museums. I was at the Andy Warhol Museum for many years. And my um, mentor at the time, Eric Shiner, who went on to left the Warhol, went to Sotheby's New York and is now um, with White Cube Gallery. He told me, you know, leave Pittsburgh. You know, I'd already been studying in Europe for a few years, but he wanted me to just get out of Pittsburgh for a number of years um, and an undetermined length of time. And as I mentioned also on Thursday, I fell in love with New Orleans. So New Orleans was where I wanted to be. I was coming down here, the gallery scene was much richer than it was in Pittsburgh. So I thought I'll get this, you know, sort of other aspect of the art world um, in a commercial gallery. I thought I would be here for a year, go back to Europe to get my master's, and then continue on in curatorial work in museums. Nine years later, here I still am. I just sort of fell very comfortably into the position. I loved how I got to do a little bit of everything, working with artists, working with the clients. In a museum, your position is so um, specific, and that's just, you do that same uh, role every day, and Working at a gallery, you have to wear all the hats. Amanda does everything just as much as I do. And I just, I think every day is so different that um, it's kept my attention and excitement. Okay, next question. Do you have a favorite or unforgettable artist that you've worked with? And why were they a favorite or unforgettable in your books? So... I'm not going to show any favoritism to any of my represented artists because I just, I want to, you know, be fair to them. I love them all equally, as any mother would say about their children. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about, just briefly, Mel Chin. We worked on an exhibition of works that were related to works in a, a retrospective founded by Miranda Lash at New Orleans Museum of Art. And so we sort of did this parallel exhibition of his work. This was the first time I'd actually met him. I had studied him in university, but I, I didn't know the man himself. And it was so incredible to 
not only get to understand his thinking and his ideas behind his work, I mean, this man is a genius. Most of his work was born out of dreams that he had, which I thought was incredible. But we did um, a secondary project after that because of my excitement about working with him of his studies for his large scale um, sculpture and conceptual work. If anybody's familiar with it, you're probably mostly familiar with these gigantic public installations and projects like this. Well, I was working with his studies, which were mostly works on paper or sort of found objects that were used to um, create these maquettes for what would eventually become the larger works. And I was more interested in this because you really saw Melchin's hand in the work. You got to see how he drew or, you know, deliberate things that he was choosing to make in his mark making on these works that you don't necessarily see in his larger scale installations because they're mostly done by a fabricator. Of course, he's very involved in that process, but they're so refined and so perfect that you don't necessarily get a sense of the artist. So Melchin will be my answer to that question. <laughs> So, is there anything else you'd like to achieve as a gallery owner or a director? World domination? <laughs> um, but no, seriously. Uh, my passion in art, and this is well before I was even working in the gallery, I always wanted to be able to reach a wider, more diverse audience. I want to present contemporary art in a way that's not intimidating or off-putting, that would make people feel welcome and present an environment to ask questions and to have discovery and just really making art accessible to people everywhere because contemporary art specifically is just that it's it's contemporary it's speaking to art right now and the context that we live in, and it should be making a statement about something about our lives, so it applies to all of us. And so yeah, just, I would, I welcome everyone into the gallery, no matter what walk of life that they're from, and I'm excited to share whatever we have up at the time with them. This next question comes from at Satu underscore Hekula underscore art. And they ask, do you have any tips for emerging artists navigating the gallery scene? Any tips would be greatly appreciated. I think exposure, especially whenever you're a beginning artist, is what's most important. So regardless of what opportunity you may have, no matter how big or small, take advantage of it. Um, apply for residencies, you know, group shows, take advantage of calls for artists, but also make sure that you are focusing on the professional side of being an artist, which includes exposure. Again, social media presence is huge, but also building your CV through the opportunities that I mentioned and keeping a, a very uh, informational CV. Um, I would say, you know, having an organized portfolio, which includes in addition to the, your CV, uh, a bio and statement. Make sure that you're constantly keeping a sort of third person account of what you're doing and how you're working, but also a first person in your artist statement to describe your work to a viewer and just give a more personal touch. And then I think one of the most important things is documenting your work. Make sure that you're photographing what you're creating Make sure that they're professional photographs. I recommend, you know, if you're working 2D, it's works on a white wall. You know, having high resolution images is so key because especially for our business, it's mostly online, particularly now with COVID and the gallery being, you know, limited capacity and people just not being excited about going out. It's really important that you're able to present your work online well for, uh, viewers and potential clients to get a really good understanding of it. Uh, people are really responding well to what you're saying here right now. It seems like we have a lot of emerging artists watching. Welcome, so, y'all. So the next couple of questions are kind of for them, and we've had a bunch of uh, emerging artists comment on our post these past couple of days. 
So this next question comes from at Shinny Shin Shin underscore. Mm -hmm. And they ask, as an emerging artist, I'd love to hear ways to stand out or tailor a portfolio. How do I put myself in specific places for opportunity? Any insight you can offer is invaluable to our, all artists and are greatly appreciated. Okay, so I think the most important thing as an artist is to find your voice and then to be consistent and authentic in that voice. So presenting yourself visually and co- cohesively is so important. You want to show anybody who's looking at your work your signature through your composition. So I want to be able to look at an artwork and say, that is absolutely that artist's work. Even if I'd never seen it before, I want to, that work to trace back to your work. And that doesn't mean not to experiment and try new things, but find a way to really put your signature aside from, you know, literally <laughs> on your work. Um, as far as putting yourself into a situation that there's opportunity. I mean, one is to always keep your eyes open for opportunity and creatively think about how you can make an opportunity. For example, maybe, you know, one of your friends owns a beauty salon and maybe you put your work there just for their clients to see. You know, you can find an opportunity in everyday interactions. Um, In addition to that, I spoke about this in a couple questions ago. I find that artists often turn down opportunities because they don't deem them important enough. And I'm not saying to donate your work to every auction that maybe your local museum has, but thinking about small opportunities, small little moments to maybe reach an audience that you've not already met, that just don't say no to anything. I'm a very big believer in being a yes man. And um, again, going back to, you know, a way to, um, to really set yourself apart. I mean, just don't conform. Make sure that you're doing something unique. Make sure that you are, you know, again, just being authentic. So someone in the comments of the live asked, how we find artists, and I think that kind of goes well with the next question that I have in store for you, which was asked by at Pennystone7. They want to know if we have a call for artists. Yeah, so the primary way that we find artists, particularly now because it's difficult to plan new exhibitions or forge new relationships with artists because we're not even able to have receptions, is our annual international call for artists for a juried exhibition entitled No Dead Artists. This year will actually be the 24th year that we've held this event. It has often produced great press. We have continued to work with artists from the show, represent them, take them to fairs. I should also note that the grand prize is a solo exhibition the following year for one artist, but from last year's, I believe we've now had two different artists have a solo show, and the year before, three or four of the artists actually went on to have a solo show. So that is really the main way to um, engage and get your foot in the door with the gallery right now. And I am very excited to announce that as a special part of today's programming, I have made the call for next year's, the 25th annual Know Dead Artist, live on our website. So if you go to our webpage, hit Call for Artists in the menu at the top, and you can begin your application for next year's exhibition. They take place every September, and then as I mentioned, one artist gets a show the following year. So please go there, and good luck. The next question comes from an artist in Pakistan, actually, at k.s underscore moogle underscore official. They ask, what is the process of getting our work exhibited in a gallery? So this is one of the things that I always like to talk to artists about. When approaching a gallery, you don't want to just show up with your portfolio. You know, we as I mentioned, wear many hats, so we're often quite busy. We are not just sitting around looking for new artists. So you want to be very respectful of the gallerist's 
schedule as well as their process. So I recommend sending a very succinct email to the gallery, introducing yourself, dropping a link to your website, and asking them what is your process for reviewing new artists or uh, taking artwork submissions so that you're, you're showing that you are taking a step farther to be considerate of the gallerist and you are also expressing your interest in that gallery. It's good to make a connection with the gallery as well, so make sure that you talk about some way that you feel that you fit that gallery's program as well. So at Christopher John Schroeder um, asks, how can I share, show my work in your gallery? So again, um, the primary way is no dead artists. Uh, I'll speak a little bit more about that actually. So I, two little stories. One, Amy Barney Siegel, who is an artist that we represent now, had applied to no dead artists um, at least once. And I noted that her work had changed. She's a local artist, so I was already familiar with her work. And she had taken this new direction in her work, but, I, but she was not selected for the exhibition. So I reached out to her and asked her to send me some more images. And it ended up being that she got a solo show not, not too many months after she was not accepted to know that artist. So in one hand, it's great to just apply because Amanda and I might be viewing your work there and despite not being chosen for the show, there's other opportunities that are available. We really use the call for artists as a way to just, you know, kind of organize the many artist inquiries that we get, mind you, on a daily basis and have everything in front of us and then we just go through, we set out, you know, a certain amount of time to just focus and look at each one and make sure that everybody who's written us gets um, the time that they are uh, really owed for, for going out on a limb and reaching out to a gallery and um, consider whether for that show or again, like I said, with AMA um, for their own show separate from that. At D.F. Brooks asks, what's the thought process when considering representing an artist? So, the first thing that we think about is usually, do they fit the gallery? Jonathan Ferrar Gallery specifically focuses on artists that are innovating normal processes. So, if you are a photographer but you're doing this other sort of interesting thing when you reach your final print, um, something innovative within that domain. So, again, going back to my advice to making sure that you fit within a gallery's um, aesthetic or their point of view, if you're applying or writing a gallery that focuses on abstract art and you are a representational artist, that's probably not the right fit for you. So making sure that there is, um, there's a, a some sort of binding factor with your work, with the narrative of and conversation that all of the other artists represented by that gallery are having. Additionally, for us, you know, we're always thinking about what, what sort of voids do we have in our program? Being that we focus on a specific uh, innovation in medium, it doesn't limit us visually to what we show. We really have a little bit of everything and being in New Orleans, a smaller city, you kind of have to um, have that sort of uh, wider spread point of view. So we're always thinking, do we, do we need a landscape artist? Are we light on photographers? Do we not have enough uh, figurative work? These sorts of things. And as relationships start and end with the gallery, we're constantly identifying what do we need to be keeping our eye out for. Trends in the art market also help us determine that. Um, that's also ever-changing, so, you know, there's so many different ways that we approach it, but it's, and this is the answer that everybody hates, is we show what we love, and 
if it speaks to us and we believe in it, then we are confident that we are going to be able to sell it and share it with great reception from our patrons. So we're getting a lot of love in the comments. Hello. My mom just chimed in. <laughs> hey, Amanda's mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, people want to know, what is some general knowledge that you think artists from all walks should know about how to interact with galleries? So a lot of this is sort of redundant with what I've already talked about, making sure you fit in with you know, what the gallery's point of view is, that, um, that you are being professional when you approach galleries. One thing I'd like to talk about in terms of professionality, so I don't like social media, or at least I don't do it personally for myself, and Amanda mostly handles the gallery's social media accounts. So writing a direct message on Instagram or messaging on Facebook are not the best ways to come across my desk because often it's just Amanda and I, so we're too busy to even check those messages. Um, we do try to go through them regularly, but it's not going to be an automatic response. Mm, emailing is always the best way. Um, send everything in as I mentioned, a succinct, um, very organized fashion by email, and that will be sure I don't let any emails go unanswered. So that is sort of my biggest uh, pet peeve, if you will. Um, I said being organized, and I guess if you're already represented by a gallery, you should continue to promote yourself. The gallery is not the be-all, end-all of your artistic career. You should continue your own social media presence. You should continue any sort of correspondence with your clients that you have, because the more people that are sharing your work, including yourself, the more likely you are to, you know, get somebody to come to your next exhibition or to, you know, find a, a new client for your work. And so really just casting all the nets and being your own biggest hero. Yeah. Okay, so at Jill Arwen Art has another question. She asks, when you tap artists for a show, do you wait for them to make something for it? Uh, if so, how much time do you give them? Or do you get something that's already finished? She also goes on to ask if it's ever occurred where you've had to replace an artist you had lined up for a show and how that worked out. Mm -hmm. Do you curate one-person shows? And if you do, is your process different from group shows? Okay, great questions, Jill. Um, typically, when I'm putting together an exhibition, I already have artwork in mind for that show. There are occasions where I just, an artist's work is so cohesive that I know anything could work. It, it really depends on the show, but usually I'm, I, I will say I want this specific piece, that specific piece. In the case of Art and Doom, we saw Peter Olson's um, photographs baked into ceramics throughout the show. Um, he did a series after I had originally presented him the idea about the show called Impending Doom, so it has a nice connection to the show. And several of those new pieces are um, are in this exhibition. So it was nice that you know Peter in this case rose to the occasion to create works that he felt would strengthen his presence within this group show. Um, Artists are often faced with challenges and um, creative blocks that will inhibit their ability to participate in a show. Um, there were a few artists that, in the earlier stages of planning Art and Doom, had not been able to go through with the exhibition in the end. One of them, congratulations, had a child. Um, and that just had him totally strapped on paternity leave. But there's, there's often um, 
the need to be flexible in this business. It's not just curating shows. Occasionally, we'll have a gallery artist scheduled for an exhibition for a certain month, and they won't be able to work that month. So we need to be able to, you know, um, not stress out about these things and sort of move things around. As far as one-person shows, um, I've curated a few. It's usually um, to sort of memorialize some sort of special event, like maybe the artist received some sort of great award, or in the case of Mel Chin, he had the, the mid-career exhibition at New Orleans Museum of Art, so we did an exhibition in, um, in conjunction with that. Or I also, I curated, we had a, an artist in the gallery who passed away um, from ovarian cancer in 2013. So a year after her passing, Sandy Chisholm, I um, curated a show in 2014 of just looking at her entire career and works that um, remained in her estate that we had. And so those are sort of special examples of why I would um, put my voice into a solo artist's um, thought process because normally our solo shows at the gallery it is a conversation with me um, to talk about what works are right for the show but it's usually the artist is working on a new series of work and they are presenting that in their voice so my curatorial involvement is just really from the sort of consultant standpoint Someone in the comments of this live stream wants to know how COVID has changed things at the gallery and in the art world. Well, we were closed for over two months. We closed, so we went to an art fair in New York, Volta, during Armory Week, and I came back early, actually, to open Art and Doom, and then the next week we had to close, so the show was only open for a couple days. Um, we were closed, we reopened, Amanda, correct me if I'm wrong, like mid-June. We, when New Orleans went to phase one of reopening, we didn't rush to open, we gave it a couple weeks, and then we um, opened just before phase two started. And since then, uh, it's been very quiet in this neighborhood. We are in the arts district within the sort of warehouse district, central business district area, and it's mostly hotels here and, um, and restaurants, of course, but with tourism being very, very minimal, um, the foot traffic in the neighborhood has been quiet, as well as people working in businesses in the neighborhood they're either just going to work and then going home, or maybe they're still just working from home. So that's probably the most noticeable difference. Um, so because of that, and this was really um, a collaboration of Amanda and I, at the beginning of quarantine, we began these takeovers, um, specifically focusing on artists, but then Amanda had that great idea <laughs> having me come on and so um people that, are loving it okay <laughs> oh, <I'm> great <laughs> um the artist takeovers were something for us to to just keep us moving along keep our um momentum going because not coming into the gallery every day obviously was this huge change of pace of life and you know not having exhibitions to plan certainly like slowed down my workflow so um that's another big thing that that's positive about covid um and i'm glad that so many of you are tuning in each week for these and interacting with the artists and myself and um yeah uh the gallery receptions as i mentioned we can't have new exhibitions because we can't have opening receptions which is really the way that we kind of open the the show to the public and drum up the, the, the interest in those shows. So um, there's that. White Linen Night is canceled. As I mentioned, we're having a month-long event, White Linen Light, um, that will sort of be this contingency plan of 
getting people safely and spread across the month through the doors to see the exhibitions and really focus on the art and um, that has been something that has been born out of COVID. And I guess finally we're just trying to come up with other creative ideas like the takeovers to reach a, a greater audience and keep us moving forward without doing our normal programming. So I would love to hear your comments about what we've been doing that works or isn't working, maybe something that especially many of you are not in New Orleans or not able to visit the gallery in New Orleans. What do you want to see? What can we share with you to um, give you a better sense of what's happening at the gallery right now? Um, so you can be a part of what what is really memorable about the changes that COVID has brought to the gallery. There has been one more question that has come in through the live and at Shinny Shin Shin underscore uh, wants to know if there are some current art trends that you've noticed or if you've seen a shift in the art trends recently. I think my favorite shift that I see happening right now is um, in conjunction with the Black Lives Matter movement. I feel like there's a real importance and focus on black artists working right now who have historically not been given the proper attention and spotlight that they deserve. And so I'm really excited to see a lot of these artists now coming to the forefront of what we're talking about in art. And I think I'll just leave it at that and let you guys explore. We have a handful of black artists working at our gallery. I'll just briefly mention E. Paul Julian, who's half of E2, Ruth Owens, um, a fabulous local painter here in New Orleans, as well as Riwa, who is based in Nigeria. Um, please take a look at their work, but also please do follow this Black Lives Matter movement within the art community. Excellent. So we're now kind of changing the tone of the rest of the live Are session. <laughs> yep. And I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire questions. Oh, okay. Boy. So what's the most rewarding part of the job? Um, I would say whenever I take an artwork to a client and, or ship an artwork to a client and they respond to it and they're just so inspired and so in love, and then the other half of that is whenever I give my artists their checks and <laughs> I just feel like, you know, I'm helping both people all at once and it's just a beautiful thing. Aside from your position at the gallery, how else are you involved in the New Orleans art scene? Well, I am a regular attendee of our local museums. I am a member of all of them. I uh, was active in the Kohlmeyer Circle at the Ogden Museum of Art whenever um, that was uh, still possible to congregate like that. Um, most importantly, I am currently the Vice President of the Arts District New Orleans. That is the organization here in New Orleans that binds all of the galleries as well as the museums in this neighborhood and a bunch of the local businesses get pulled in to just create the synergy for this very um, walkable, explorable arts community um, here in the Arts District. What activity or hobby did you pick up during quarantine before the gallery reopened? So much to my mother's chagrin, I have not been my normal blonde and I have dyed my hair a different color usually every week bi-weekly. Um, there's been some very interesting colors. Some worked, some didn't. Unfortunately, I don't have images to show you all. I'm going to put on my Masks mask. Masks on. We have a... Because we have a guest. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I've been... I've been just playing with hair color a little bit, and I'll say pink has been my, my favorite iteration of those. Oh, someone wants to know the name of the Nigerian artist again. Her name is Rewa. That's R-E-W-A. She had her takeover last week. So definitely yeah. check her out. Her handle is at art by Rewa. Um, so next question. Who is your guilty celeb, guilty pleasure celeb to follow? Like, who do you know way too much about? Jeffree Star. I'm sure most of you won't know him. He 
began as a um, makeup artist, and then he had a music career, and now he's known for being this sort of conundrum makeup beauty guru. It's he's just so fascinating to me. <laughs> <laughs> what are you watching on Netflix right now? Pose. I'm obsessed. If any of you have not seen it yet, immediately start watching it. It's so addictive. And I don't think I've ever cried as much as I have watching that show. So I know you're a Taurus. So what's the most Taurus thing about you? I'm stubborn and definitely a control freak. I am as down to earth as it can possibly be. (laughs) What's something unexpected about you? I'm an Eagle Scout. What do you miss most about pre-quarantine life? Gallery openings. And last but not least, is there anything else you would like to say as we wrap this live up? I cannot wait to flip the script (laughs) and inflict the same torture on Amanda. (laughs) All of you, please tune in the weekend of August 13th to see hers. And you will also get to see us installing No Dead Artists then. We will be putting the show up and talking a bit more about the process of applying for it, but also what happens once you're accepted. And I hope you guys tune in then. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, I am so appreciative of our following, and I look forward to doing more of this in the future. This was so much fun. Bye, y'all. Can you guys tell her now?